Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome back to the Rethinking Cyber podcast with me, your host, Rebecca McLaughlin Easton. I'm delighted to say that my special guest this week is Dr. Craig Wright, whose bright ideas have resulted in thousands of patent applications. And with more than 30 years' experience in the information technology and IT security field, he's conducted thousands of engagements for private and public sector organizations, including building protection systems for the Australian Stock Exchange and helping create the architecture for the world's first online casino. And never one to sit idle in between assignments and running a company, Dr. Wright has also found time for two additional PhDs in law and applied mathematics. In 2015, the keen entrepreneur and businessman founded the company Enchain, of which he currently holds the position of chief strategist. Enchain says that it strives to unlock the potential of enterprise data by making it reliable, holding firm to the belief that the world should be able to trust in the data upon which it relies. So what does Enchain do? Well, it says its overarching aim is to reduce costs, mitigate risks, increase efficiency, and open new revenue opportunities for its clients. And today we'll ask Dr. Wright how, and much more besides. Dr. Wright, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for speaking to me today. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here. Let me start by asking you about your early inspiration, indeed the inspiration you've had throughout your career, not least how you became interested in cryptology and in the cyber world at large. Uh, so it goes right back to my grandfather. My grandfather uh, actually worked on Purple, which was uh, similar to Enigma, but the Japanese version um, of the, the, the coding system. Um, from there, I've uh, been involved in the internet before it was called the internet. Uh, and then I moved into information security and um, uh, the unsolved holy grail of the internet was always micropayments. And I wanted to create a system that would enable all of that and open up opportunities on the internet, uh, not sort of the ad-based internet we have now, but, but one where people can buy and sell services directly. Dr. Wright, tell our viewers and listeners more about distributed ledger technology, DLT. What exactly is it and how can companies use it to their advantage? What you're doing is publicizing information. So um, there are a lot of misconceptions here, like people have private uh, blockchains, etc. There's no such thing. The security model isn't hashing, it isn't any of that. That's, a, that's an economic um, sort of incentive uh, that demonstrates the location of nodes and de-anonymizes them, allowing them to monitor and work in the same model as a publisher. So nodes are these things that act as the distributed ledger, taking a copy of all of the transactions and storing them uh, with a hashed or sort of index so that any user can uh, prove a transaction has occurred and unlike cryptocurrencies bitcoins not these are systems that are traceable and so the difference between bitcoin isn't all the mythology about uh, sort of magic internet money there have been hundreds of attempts at, at um, proof of work distributed uh, digital cash systems the problem is all of them tried to be a cryptocurrency which is anonymous bitcoin is traceable so it allows the uh, ability to stop an uh, anonymous crime, as we saw with Silk Road being taken down, and um, for people to have ownership in goods. And how about the governments? How can they truly harness DLT in securing CNIs? There are multiple uses for uh, how you could actually build uh, national currencies, how you could build uh, sort of passport identity systems, etc. The sort of key balance between what people don't understand in Bitcoin is the ability to have something that is pseudonymous, that is private, that is protected, but that very few people can actually um, see and understand unless they're part of the transaction. So as an example, a government could build a passport system that allows the tracing of all the individuals in and out of the country um, that could be proven to be with the person that could hold all their biometrics. And um, no one on the internet, because of the changing key structure, would ever know that it's that user. But equally, the government could then track 
um, the person coming in and out of different countries and even have far more information than they do now with stamps and other things on passports. Additionally, from a monetary point of view, it allows government to create different programmable aspects of money, such as they could create coupons that effectively act as cash, but can't be used uh, if they're given to someone in spending on uh, something like alcohol or cigarettes, but could be there for rent or paying the school fees for children. Cybercrime, as we're all well aware, has risen exponentially in recent years. And with so much greater access to the internet and the internet having such a bearing on our daily lives, we know that important things have to be done to tackle the problem. In your opinion, tell me what you think are the three most important cyber concerns to address and the technology that we have disposable to us these days, how would it help us address the problem? I'm going to roll all this up and one of the things we've been working on that we have now released is uh, the um, notary tool for Bitcoin. What this allows is for the recovery and freezing of, of Bitcoin following court orders. Now, a lot of people believe that Bitcoin and other related technologies cannot be uh, sort of intercepted or changed or, or frozen because the whole sort of anonymous mantra, but that's wrong. There's no encryption in Bitcoin. And because it's not encrypted and it has a ledger, it's analogous to an old school double entry book where you have it on paper. Now you don't go and change everything on paper, but you can append records. And the appending of records allows law enforcement to seize and interact with illicit funds. Now, all illicit activity comes down, uh, well, practically all, down to economic foundations. Even when you're talking things like terrorism, if they don't get funding, it doesn't happen. But uh, people smuggling and the sex trade, the sale of um, illicit photographs, the uh, interaction of people in malware, all of this happens because the ability to have untraceable money and with tracing and freezing, all of that's going to be you know, able to be stopped. Court orders will be taken out and um, um, over time, we're going to find all, uh, once governments start to understand the power of being able to do this, they're going to require any cryptocurrency that is out there to implement this sort of feature. Dr. Wright, talk to me about the innovations or the new technologies that you believe are much needed but haven't been developed yet when it comes to keeping us all safe. If we're talking about government use, whether we're talking about central bank digital currencies, national um, um, sort of identity cards, any of the possible uses, then government can use this for tracking and tracing individuals to reduce uh, security problems. For instance, passport control could be improved. The ability to have driver's licenses would be streamlined. Uh, it would be possible to have all of this securely stored on your phone so that you could have everything with you. And even if your phone was lost, you would be able to download and instantly have all the biometrics and all of your information copied across so that you can re-access everything wherever you are, not having to go through all of the existing problems in um, having uh, reissuing done. So on top of that, it allows for monetary policy to be improved. For instance, we could have programmable money. If there were government benefit programs and uh, they were being given out to people in uh, low uh, sort of income or welfare areas, it could be given with the uh, sort of restriction that it couldn't be used for buying alcohol or uh, that it had to be put towards rent or school fees for the children, that sort of thing. And there we have to leave our conversation. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me today. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Our thanks again to Dr. Craig Wright for being with us today on the podcast. And thank you also to our viewers and listeners right around the world. For more episodes or exclusive interviews of this kind, all you need to do is head to Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'll see you again soon. Until then, take care and goodbye.